Hi, welcome everybody to my talk, Performance Evaluation of Generative Adversarial Neural Networks in a Seamless Supervised OCR Use Case. Um, before I start, a few words about myself. So I'm a data scientist at Innovex. Uh, being a mathematician, I really like mathematical modeling, so in a way describing behavior of the real world in, in mathematical ways. Um, I did some projects in recommendation systems, uh, which is a topic that I really like. Um, I'm a big proponent of data science in production because I think that's the only way to actually show the value. So don't just do uh, proof of concepts, um, roll it out in production. Um, I'm a big fan of the Python data stack. So this is also one of the reasons that I'm here at the PyCon. And I got a little... Um, a tool uh, of myself, Python tool, um, PyScaffold, if you heard of it, this allows you to make your own um, standard compliant Python packages. So the work I'm going to present here um, was actually done in a collaboration with one of my uh, master's students, Florian Tanten, which I supervised from end of last year till mid of this year. Meanwhile, he has successfully graduated from the KIT. So most of his work, um, uh, most of the things I'm going to present is actually um, from his uh, master thesis. So one more slide about the company I work for, Innovex. Um, who of you know Innovex? Okay, a few because we also got an office in, in Karlsruhe. We are an IT project house focusing on digital transformation and we do all the development um, for web, mobile, app, also uh, IT and operations. We have trainings and of course also a big department for data science and big data where I work in. So to get an overview of the topics we're gonna cover today, um, first I'm gonna start and motivate the, the use case. Um, what it has to do with text spotting and the challenges of text spotting. I'm going to show you what kind of data we had at our hand, uh, the pipeline we came up with. Then I'm going to um, give you a really short introduction uh, in a nutshell about generative adversarial networks and how we use them for semi-supervised learning. In the end, some performance results um, where we compared semi-supervised learning based on guns with other techniques. So before I start with the use case, I need you to understand what the so-called vehicle identification number or VIN for short is. It's like a, a unique identifier for your car. And if you stand in front of your car and if you look at the windshield, you see on the, on the right lower side, you see the 70 digits number. And um, this number gives you a lot of details about the car, like the manufacturer, what kind of model, the year, um, also a little bit about um, how, how good the engine is and so on. And this is a unit, it's like a fingerprint for your car. And you also have this number in your uh, vehicle license, so in your Fahrzeugschein of German. And um, now imagine that you have, like one of our customers, some kind of e-commerce market uh, place where you sell your car, your used cars, something like Mobile.de or Autoscout, for instance. And if you now want to put your car on such a marketplace, it's, of course, a really tedious uh, thing to, to put in all the details about your car. And it's much shorter to just type in the 70 digits number. And many of those market platforms actually do it like this. But what would be even more convenient for you as a user would be if you could just take your smartphone, like snap a picture of your uh, vehicle uh, registration document and let the app do the rest. So the app would find um, the, the VIN number on, on the page and extract it, then go to some database, um, like the Dutch group database, which kind of translates this number into all the details. And then already all the things pop up that you want to sell a BMW X3 from the year 2013, for instance. And the last part, of course, already exists because you can already type in on many of those, um, platforms, the numbers, but we wanted to concentrate on the first part to show in, a, in first a proof of concept that this works. And when we started this, we first thought, okay, it's just OCR. How complicated can it be? So we looked at some OCR libraries. So there are basically two worlds, the commercial software world and the open source tools world. 
And uh, so we do a lot of things at Innovex with open source tools and also in the sense that later on, if you want to integrate more and so it's, it's really better in most cases to work with open source software. So we looked at some commercial ones. I'm going to show you later some results of the Cloud Vision API, but we concentrated on open source tools and there um, Google's Tesseract is one of the best ones. So we tested this. This was way before we even started with something like a, like a master thesis. We got from some colleagues some uh, driving license uh, or vehicle license. We just cut out um, the part, the region of interest with the win. And we did some norm normal computer vision um, techniques like, like background elimination and so on to, to make it clearer. And this we fed into Tesseract. And at first sight, it looks quite good, but you can already see that uh, Google's Tesseract um, replaced all the sixes from the original num number with Gs. And this was something where we were quite, um, yeah, not so convinced. So even with a really simple number like this and a lot of pre-processing, we already had mistakes. And that's not even the worst part. So we grabbed some more of those um, of those vehicle registration documents, and since in Germany, I mean, dig digitalization is not so big right now, it seems like those cards are still printed with the help of typewriters or like typewriter-like machines, because you can sometimes see that you have um, letters like melting into each other. It's not really printed above the line, but more like on the line. So you might think, hey, I've seen this. This looks more like a capture. And this makes it... It makes it really complicated. So the, the, the pre-processing pipeline we built up to, to get to this step um, actually then remove the line and start uh, like, uh, yeah, like destroying the letters and, and digits. And of course, Tesseract could not do anything with this. So this was the point where they thought, okay, we have to dig deeper to actually come up with something useful to impress our customer. And um, this is also uh, when he said, okay, let's, let's make a whole master thesis about this topic. And so the next thing is, of course, text spotting, because this is what we want to do. And what is text spotting? So text spotting basically is two tasks. If you think of this, uh, of this picture, this is a picture of some house number, you not only have to detect that this is a picture of house numbers, you have to detect where those digits are and you have to recognize these digits so that it's a, a three, seven, and nine, and also the position that you can later say it's the number 379 and not uh, 973 or so. And those two tasks, I mean, there's a lot of research in the last 20, 30 years or even more went into this. For the detection and extraction part, they are like more like classical um, computer vision tools. Um, some of those which we also applied in our first trials, um, things like com connected components, um, edge detection and so on. Then there are other approaches where you have kind of a sliding window. You slide over... Um, the picture and then do some uh, detection. Is there some, uh, something or is there not something? Um, and therefore you can use support vector machines, convolutional neural networks. And of course, since this is really computational intensive, if you start moving slides uh, over this, there's also other met methods like region proposal methods that say here is something interesting by selective search, for instance. And then you have extracted the character or even sometimes the word. So some methods uh, work with whole words. And then you, you kind of cut out the interesting parts and uh, you do a normal character recognition. So that means uh, you have some classifier that says, well, it's a three or it's a seven and so on. And you can use support vector machine, nearest neighbors, convolutional neural networks. And we started to read all those those papers about fast RCNN, faster RCNN, YOLO, and so on. And there's a common pattern that uh, the convolutional neural networks they perform really, really good. So this is why we said, okay, we we also going to go in this direction and train something on um, the many vehicle registration documents with a convolutional neural network. So. Just in a nutshell, a short reminder what the convolutional neural network is. So basically you have two or let's say yeah, two building blocks. You have convolutional kernels 
This is shown here in the lower right. And this convolution kernel um, is applied to some input image. So it's just going over this and generating feature maps. So for each kernel, you have a feature map. And the basic idea is, so each, um, each kernel generates a, a feature and really learns the feature with, um, and this is in cont contrast like it was done before, like with Gaussian filters that someone had to program these by hand. And then you have these features and then you want to reduce um, those feature maps. So you do some subsampling with um, maybe max pooling is one of the things that is often used. So you just take from each of those quadrants the, the highest uh, value. This reduces the feature maps and then you do convolutions again and you get more and more features. And if um, um, as you go down, the, the depth of your neural network, you get more and more generic features. Like the first one would be maybe only edge detection. And here later you would um, even recognize whole faces. And in the end, all those features are just combined in some fully connected network that uh, does the, um, yeah, does the classification. And uh, yeah, basically the, the whole idea is just let the neural network learn all the feature engineering. So, um, this was like the theoretical part when you thought, okay, now we, we, we know how it works. Let's do something about it. Let's get some data. And uh, luckily, um, we found Stadtmobil. So I think many of you, at least the ones from Karlsruhe, know Stadtmobil. They uh, gave us uh, 170 images of their vehicle registration documents, which uh, we are really uh, grateful about that we had this uh, possibility because not everyone is just handing over the vehicle, vehicle registration document. And um, still 170 images is not that much. If you think like, oh, deep learning, you takes tons of data. And uh, for instance, the ImageNet, if you know this uh, library, I mean, um, they have more than 1 million uh, images. So 170 is really not that much. So we thought, okay, let's make a master thesis with two um, objectives. First of all, at the end, we want to have some kind of prototype where we can put in um, a picture of, uh, of a vehicle registration document, and in the end, we get the extracted uh, vehicle identification number. And secondly, since we don't have that much data, we want to make a comparison of supervised methods to semi-supervised methods, because the idea was if the prototype is successful, we get in more and more um, vehicle registration documents quite easily. But of course, someone has to do the labeling. And uh, if you don't want to be the person who sits there and types um, all those um, wins down, um, it's of course much easier if you have some, some semi-supervised method. So to um, have those or to, to fulfill those two objectives, we came up with following um, pipeline. So basically, we start with a picture. Um, of the of the document, then we extract the region of interest. So this is done uh, thanks to the, the layout of um, of this document. So we have many rows, and um, we know that we just have to find with some um, with some, some detector the first uh, letter in the lower uh, in the upper left uh, corner. And uh, since we know. Um, then the, the distance to the, the other rows, we can easily extract what you see here, then this snippet with the, having the complete win. Then we take a sliding window approach. So this means we go over this snippet and do a lot of windows. So this means sometimes you have a character in there, sometimes you don't have a character in there. Then we have a convolutional neural network um, that is a character uh, detector. So that just says, yeah, it's a character or it's not a character. Um, this leads to a drastic reduction of all those sliding windows, but still we can have a double detection because if you are over a letter, if you just move a little tiny bit, then you will see in both cases um, the, the letter. Um, to overcome this, then there's a standard meth method called uh, non-maximum suppression. This is basically, if you imagine you move over those different uh, detections and it will always go uh, up and down. So the detector will say like 80% it's a character and then 90 and so on. And you take just every local maximum and suppress all the others. Um, and then you end up having um, a single uh, character. And these 
17 pictures are then fit into the uh, character recognizer, um, which will lead then eventually to the detection of those uh, characters. So this is uh, what we did for, for the pipeline. Then the second thing was, um, okay, how do we handle now the small data problem that we had? So everyone's talking about data lakes, but we only had a few drops of data, or we felt at least like this with 170 um, pictures. So what first came into our mind was um, what I showed you earlier. It looked a little bit like a capture, right? So we thought, okay, why not? download one of those capture generation tools, just take the background of um, a vehicle registration document and start generating own wins and use this additionally. So the big uh, advantage is that you have labeled data, of course. You just generate your wins and, and uh, the pictures for it. So that was the first idea, and if you use this then to train um, the convolutional neural networks, it also gets better, and I will show the result later. The other technique that we applied is uh, data augmentation. So this uh, just means that if we have those little snippets of, let's say, zero, we start like moving a little bit around, and it means it's still a zero for us, but it already helps a lot for the neural network to ritualize and to actually become, um, yeah, a space invariant. So that a little like moving the zero around still makes it a zero, and this is then something the neural network uh, can quite easily learn from this. So with the help of the data augmentation techniques, we basically generated our training and test sets. And um, so for um, the character de de detector, we, um, yeah, we took one character, we moved a little bit around it, and then we had like, uh, like the, the class of characters. And moving much more around it then leads to characters like this, like, like actual non-characters. Like, uh, and um, therefore, uh, with us, we made uh, the class uh, no character and got a data set of those two classes. And the same we did for the character recognizer. I mean, there you have the 36 different ones and you just move a little bit around them to actually get more and augment your data. And there we also got the data set. So in total for our 170 uh, vehicle registration documents, we split them 50-50 because um, normally you do 80% to 20%, but we wanted to make really sure that if we later have something, we have at least a somewhat large-ish uh, number of things where we can test the whole pipeline, so with 85 images. So um, we did a data augmentation techniques then, and in the end we ended up having 42,000 images for the detector and 8,000 images for the recognizer. The same, of course, for the testing data set. And additionally, of course, we kept the whole images to test later on um, the, the, the whole pipeline. So um, for the classifiers, as I said, we used a, a supervised convolutional neural network then to test on this data and uh, then later compare it with semi-supervised adversarial generative neural network. And to tell you what this is, short explanation and actually also the impact of these techniques. So Jan uh, Lecan, who is the director of Facebook AI research, um, said that uh, generative adversarial neural networks and all the variations are now uh, um, one of the most interesting ideas in machine learning in the last 10 years, which is quite a huge expression coming from someone uh, like him. And uh, the, the guy who actually invented it, uh, Ian Goodfellow, um, is, is still quite a young researcher. He's uh, now at uh, Google Brain. And he had this idea, um, I, th I think I read once about it, it's somewhere in a bar that he said, why not combine uh, game theory and um, this whole world of neural network? And actually, that is, that's actually the key point, that in a generative adversarial neural network, you have um, two competing partners, uh, parties. You have uh, a generator and a discriminator. And now let's think like the generator is something like a crook who tries to, to forge money. 
And of course, this money needs to be as realistic as possible. And then you have a kind of detective who needs to decide, is this real money or is this just, just fake money? And um, those two compete in the sense that you show to the detective like um, consecutively real images or generated ones. And the discriminator then says, well, it's the right one or it's, it's just fake. And of course, everyone, both of them, they want to learn, they want to get better, and that means they need feedback. So if the discriminator says, well, that's uh, real money, then someone decides if it was real money and if it was true, then uh, you, uh, he gets the feedback and also the generator gets the feedback so that the generator knows, well, I have to change a little bit. So in, in the world of uh, deep learning, of course, both are uh, convolutional neural networks, a classical uh, classifier um, for the detective, um, uh, for the discriminator, and um, just a transposed one for, for the crook. So this is basically... Uh, instead of uh, convolution, um, you do transpose convolutions, and uh, um, then there's also opposite of the max pooling, and you, of course, think what is the, the, the one part that you start with. So this is just a small vector with random numbers, random noise, and from this random noise you generate then images. And uh, this, is, this is how it works, and you can already see, since we now feed into the um, discriminator, not only the real images, but only generated ones. This also helps the discriminator to, uh, to smooth the, the, the whole space, to regularize. In our case, um, it's of course not money. It's, um, it's characters or non-characters for the character de de detector. And to get a little bit more uh, mathematical, if you formulate this, then it's it's a so-called min-max problem. So um, you have a cost function, so some uh, some cross entropy, and uh, in the end, the the discriminator wants to come up with good weights for the neural networks so that this uh, loss function is is maximized, and the generator is just working in the opposite direction, so it's trying to find good weights. To, to minimize this and the impact it has, what it can change is, of course, that it tr tries to, to, uh, yeah, make images that look as real as possible because then the discriminator, uh, makes wrong, um, comes up with wrong results and, um, this becomes, uh, less. So to show you how this looks like, so uh, on the left side we see a training image for character, um, and non-character. And um, on the right side, we see how this, uh, how the generator becomes better in generating um, little images that also look like this is like an X and also a lot of uh, non-characters. Of course, for the generator, it's easier to generate something that looks more like a non-character. But you already see here, we also have the, the lines um, where the, the numbers should be printed on and so on. So, um, how has this to do with semi-supervised learning now? So, the, the, to repeat the idea of semi-supervised learning, so on the one hand, we have supervised learning where we need a lot of labeled data. And um, this is, of course, always a rare resource. So, um, even if you have, have big data, most of the time it's not really labeled. And on the other hand, um, we have unsupervised learning without any labels at all. They would rather think about distances and clusters, and it's a whole different set of techniques. And with the help of semi-supervised learning, you try to combine both of the, of the worlds, um, like the advantages of both of the worlds, and say, well, I have a few of my, my data is, um, is actually labeled, and uh, some other parts are not labeled at all, and somehow I still want to get additional information from this unlabeled part. It's a little bit like if you think of a, of a child, um, I mean, if the child someday learns, um, hey, that's a cat and that's a dog, and you, you tell only a few times, so oh, that's a cat and that's a dog, and uh, still it helps uh, for the, the child a lot 
if it sees a lot more cats and dogs because then you kind of, okay, there are two clusters and from a little bit of the data, I have learned that one cluster is rather the cat and the other one is the dog and this helps so you don't have to say 1,000 times that's the cat and that's the dog. At least I hope so for most children. Um, yeah, and how does this now work <laughs> in an unsupervised, uh, in a, in a semi-supervised way? So before the first picture um, I showed you, there was only real labeled and gener uh, real data and uh, generated data. And now, of course, we have to bring in the, the real unlabeled data. So we have another pot, let's say, um, another bucket of the real unlabeled data. And of course, the discriminator also needs to do something more fancy. So it's not anymore, is it fake or is it not fake? It's additionally, if it's not fake, what kind of class is it? So is it a character or is it a not a character? And this means that the, the cost function actually comes a bit, little bit more uh, complicated. You more or less have an, an if then in there. So like, okay, if it's, if it's real, then, um, you have the additional task to say if it's a character or if it's not a character, and this also attributes to the loss um, for your backpropagation and so on. Or if it's fake, then it's enough to just say if it's fake. But still, um, by learning it this way, the, the, the network also learns from this uh, real unlabeled images. And this is, again, the thing where it, um, yeah, where it kind of regularizes over all the, the different uh, 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 images. So now um, we implemented all those and um, I'm gonna show you um, the results for um, the character recognizer and uh, the, um, yeah, the character detector. So for the character detector, what we first did is we reduced our training set because we wanted to see, okay, what are the benefits of the semi-supervised techniques? So on the x-axis, you see the, the size of the label training set we put in there. And we start with something like really, really small. So only 20 um, images of characters and non-characters that were labeled. And you see that the, the accuracy is not so good. It's uh, roughly 70, uh, 65%. And then going up as you increase uh, the number of uh, training sets. So if we took the full training set, um, it actually was better, way better than we expected. With 42,000 images, we had a 99.7 um, accuracy. And this was also one of the key learnings uh, we actually had that even though we first thought, okay, we only have 180 images of this rich vehicle registration documents with the help of this data augmentation, we already got a result um, way better than expected. So then the next idea was what I told you, this, this capture method. So um, we still tried um, to just give it 20 um, real images and we filled up the rest with a lot of generated images. So with the ones um, you see over here that are not actual uh, ones, but uh, created with this, um, with this tool. And um, to our, yeah, to, um, yeah, what we saw is that it didn't get that much better. So we could improve like five percentage points almost to 70 and uh, it's still higher, but it's not really as, as good as we had expected actually. So we thought, okay, well, for, for our eyes, it looks really, really similar, but uh, it's not that much better at all. Then how does everything compare to just using uh, a supervised um, gun? So without using any additional unlabeled data. And we see that especially for really small um, data sizes. We had a huge improvement, over 80%. But then what is quite curious is that it's uh, that not really getting better. So it's, it's still benefiting um, of more data, but not as much as the others. And in the end, it uh, also saturates at uh, 996 and um, yeah, it gets quite similar result, but in this uh, between stage, it's, it's not as good um, as the others. 
Now comes the actual semi-supervised one, and this was for us really impressive in the sense that only having 20 uh, labeled real images we are already uh, we were already close to to 90% and also increasing drastically in the end we had i think 99.9 .9, so it was really close to to 100 and um it really had a huge improvement over um yeah over not using additionally unlabeled data or um all the other methods um quite similar is for the character recognizer so here we could not start with 20, of course, because we had uh, 36 classes. So this is why we started with 36 and multiples of it until, um, yeah, to 200, 300 and so on. And we also see a similar, um, similar results as before. So just using supervised learning is pretty bad because, yeah, having only one instance of each class, of course, does not work so well. Um, then um, the, 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 the pre-trained one with the help of those captures helped a lot in this case, but I think only due to the fact that, of course, this is really not much per class, and then we had way more due to, the, due to using these captures. And um, the 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 semi supervised uh, so the the supervised one was also not performing so well because for a, um, a purely supervised generative adversarial network it also needs a lot of data. I mean, it needs to learn the whole density, the whole distribution, um, how those characters look like. And um, if you have thirty six different classes, it became becomes of course a lot more uh, complicated for it. This is why this performed not so well. Again, the semi-supervised one, except of the first, um, uh, the first uh, X uh, value um, with 36, it was much better. So it um, was even better than the, the capture one. And um, in the end, we also had something close to, to 100. So also for this task, it performed way better um, than, than the others. Um, so to actually now test, so we, we did all this and then we said, okay, let's uh, now look at the whole pipeline. We trained everything and wanted to test how it would work in practice because this is what counts in the end, right? You have to see if you really put in the, the picture what do you get and not only what do you, what do you get if you... Uh, do it purely on your on your trained uh, data. So we put the 85 images into the whole uh, pipeline, and uh, actually we had really good results in the sense that uh, 84 um, wins were completely correctly uh, identified, and it was only uh, one where you see there's one letter. U, which it did not classify correctly. I think it classified it as an O or something. And um, this was, at least our um, conclusion was that this was to the result that we did not have many U's uh, in our training set. So maybe one could improve by adding more. And this uh, results in overall accuracy of 99.94%, uh, uh, which is quite good, but still, I mean, it's 85 images, so we have to do it uh, on, on a larger uh, test set if we get more data. Now we wanted to actually compare our results to Google's cloud vision because, yeah, Google says, well, you can just upload your things, we will do all the OCR for you. Um, so we compared ours and the Google's ones, but the Google ones, at least at that point in time, you really had to give only pictures of um, of the specific te uh, text. So what that meant for us is that we had to cut out the snippets of the of the wins for uh, Google's Cloud Vision API to digest. And this is, of course, um, something that our um, pipeline uh, does in its pre-processing. So the, the task for Google Cloud Vision becomes actually simpler. And um, to do actually comparison, it's not so easy to talk anymore about accuracy because what happens if the Google Cloud Vision API, for instance, says, well, it's only 16 uh, characters, although it's 17. And I mean, how do you compare, the, compare this? So we just took the, the Levenstein distance 
I think many of you will know this uh, distance. It's more or less saying if you have um, if you have a string and a kind of target string, how many operations do you have to do to come from the left side to the right side? And operations are things like like replacing a character, adding a character, or deleting a character. So in this case. To come from here to there, we would have to replace a by an x. We would have to replace the three by a two and add an additional one. So we have three uh, modifications, which gives us a Levenstein distance of, of three. And um, we did this for Google's Cloud Vision API and got um, a Levenstein distance of almost 4.5, which, which is quite bad. So most of the... Um, most of the wins were not correctly identified and they were lacking characters and so on. And in our case, it was uh, um, 0.011, so uh, way better. Of course, a smaller distance um, is better. Um, this was quite an uh, success for us and uh, we also showed it our, to, to our customers and um, they were also quite impressed. And to sum this up, the, the key learnings uh, we actually took from this uh, master thesis is that with the help of a, a custom solution, you can tremendously outperform some off-the-shelf software. But it really has to be for some specific use case, of course. So, um, of course, our software is not better like in all general use cases that the cloud supervision, uh, cloud vision API handles. But for this specific use case, having something custom designed performed much better. Also, uh, we took from this that um, semi-supervised methods based on guns perform really well on little data. I mean, we saw this, um, that the accuracy um, chart uh, was way higher for uh, supervised guns. But on the other hand, we also saw that um, with simple data augmentation techniques, even using only supervised learning, we already got something uh, really well. I mean, um, it was also going towards like really close to 100% accuracy. Still, the supervised gun was much better, but um, we did not expect this directly from the start that we already got there only with supervised uh, methods. So with this, I want to conclude. Um, the talk, I added a slide about uh, bibliography and um, I will upload the slides and uh, Twitter about it. So if you're interested, you can just look it up. So thanks for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions if, if you have some. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have um, something like seven minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks, I have a dozen of questions, so I will <laughs> limit myself to seven minutes. No, I was, I was uh, magnified by the talk. It was very interesting. Thanks. And at one point, I uh, lost the uh, understanding of when you generated the images and then used the uh, transpose network as a detector. Did you mean to transpose only the architecture or did you even share weights between those two models? Um, we did not uh, share weights, you share kind of the, the gradients uh, that go back, but it's the icon. Go back to the slide of, you mean here, I mean, this, this architecture is just the transposed of this one, but of course to, to generate the image, you need here different weights than you need here to come up with good features to actually discriminate between uh, the two classes or 36 classes. And, uh, yeah. So this is, this is, uh, basically how it works. But this is not, it's not the same network. It's just similar architecture transposed, but, uh, different weights. Yeah. Thank you. Then I, I have one more question about using Siamese networks, but that's something I guess we can discuss uh, one to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for the presentation. And I had a question regarding using the uh, da uh, the data without label. So when you give it to uh, guns, then if it makes a prediction, then you need to know was it true or false in order to back propagate. 
uh, if it's true, like, you, you know, the back propagator model. So what's, uh, like here, you have re real unlabeled images and you give it to discriminator and then you will have the uh, prediction. So to which, to what do you compare that uh, prediction? Yeah, this is, this is um, what I meant with like, you have a little like, let's say, if condition in the cost functional. So you can basically have uh, three cases. You have generated image, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have an image coming from here, in the best case, the discriminator should say, well, it's a fake, and then, then it's good. If it takes any of those two classes, then that's bad for the discriminator, right? In both cases, you would say, well, that gets a high loss, and the discriminator needs to update the weights and so on. If it's, let's start with here, if it's a real labeled image, one of those, then the discriminator should pick the right one. So it gets already a little, um, like bonus in a sense, uh, that it says it's in here and not in here. And additionally, it also needs to differentiate between character and non-character. So for real unlabeled image, it's just important that the discriminator picks one of those. So it could happen that it's actually in the wrong one that you as, an, as, an, as a human would say, well, this is not a character because it's a half an O or a zero and a, and a four. And the discriminator could still say it's a character and um, we don't know, right? Because it's, it's uh, unlabeled data. But still, the whole process that at least picked it somewhere in here um, already uh, already helps. And so uh, you treat it as a correct if it takes uh, C or non C. Yep. Okay. So you manipulated the loss for hmm? you. Uh, you changed the loss for each case. You have a different loss for each case. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah it's like a loss composed of many terms, and uh, some are just activated. Um, if it's a real labeled image and others are kind of deactivated, so you just have some indicator function in front of it that turns some of those terms to zero and some of those to one. And, uh, yeah, this is, this is how it works. Oh, nice. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, when guns came out like two years ago, uh, they were known to be quite unstable during training. Um, I don't know, did you experience any, any problems like mode collapse or like, were they hard to train or did it? Yeah, work? They're, they're really hard to train. So, um, it took, uh, actually, so Florian did all the training, uh, the master student. So it was, uh, it took him quite some while to come up with something. And, uh, the image that I showed is, uh, um, I mean, it's also far from, from perfect as you saw. I mean, the, right now there are even guns that create whole images that really look perfect. But to do something like this, it takes really, really long. And about the stability, I mean, also neural networks, it might happen that you retrain the same thing. You have changed nothing. It's just another initial random vector and you get a much worse result sometimes. It's even worse for uh, guns because you can have the mode collapses and it might happen that the, the generator gets far too uh, good and the discriminator falls behind. You have to keep them at the same level and there are different techniques to, to help with this. But it's, 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 it's complicated and uh, you have to know that you're going to put a lot of uh, effort into, into the training. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was concerned about the generalization. So if I now give you a new test set where I take 70 pictures of, well, car registrations of people in this room, how good will your network then perform? Um, I guess it will perform a little bit worse. I mean, depending. So we have a bias in the data. It's clearly a bias uh, in the sense that uh, um, it was only cars from Karlsruhe, which means um, also the, t the typewriter. I mean, this will... So actually, we tried it. We also took some uh, registration documents from uh, from Berlin, and there the it seems like the the printer was a little different. So some really had another font, which then gave us not as good results. So it still was still quite good, and uh, so this was kind of the bias uh, that we had um, that the vehicle registration documents looked 
a little bit different here in, in Karlsruhe than compared to, to other cities, depending on the font. Um, but, but still, I mean, the, um, the fact that with the additional, um, data, you, you definitely get some, um, you get some generalization because, I mean, we, we did the split of our training and test set right before we did something. And I mean, those, the results on those 85 images was something that was never shown to the whole thing, um, in the beginning. So. That clearly shows that there was some some generalization. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank the speaker one last time. Thanks. Thank you.